Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our first Cultures United discussion for 2024. We're so thrilled you could join us. In our last discussion, we had the opportunity to pay tribute to the important cultures, heritage, and traditions of our county's indigenous people. We highly value all of Orange County's indigenous people, groups, and tribes, and their contribution to our shared history and culture. If you would like to watch this past conversation or any of the amazing conversations we've had, please scroll down on the Cultures United webpage and check out past conversations. Um, I know you'll enjoy them, so please do. Our goal for Cultures United has always been an opportunity to bring people together, to convene, to coordinate, and to be a resource for connection in the community. Orange County has so many diverse, vibrant cultures, and we love highlighting and celebrate each of them. To all of you who have been part of this journey so far, thank you. And we appreciate all of you joining us today to learn about Orange County United Way and more about what we do in the community and also joining us on this journey to explore and embrace the cultural differences with the ultimate understanding that our differences and our diversity brings us strength. So this Cultures United is going to be a little different and I'm very excited about, uh, about this because we are gonna discuss a community service that benefits everyone in Orange County. So we are eager to introduce you to Orange County United Way's key service 211OC. Many of you might be familiar with it, but many of you might not. And this is an important number for all of us to know. 211 is an easy to remember number that anyone can call to get help accessing a vast amount of resources and assistance right here in Orange County. Our conversation today is a reflection of our community and the remarkable diverse cities and our population. We're gonna be unpacking the incredible benefits of 211 that brings not only to our most vulnerable citizens, but also nonprofits and city governments and any of us may use 211 at any point in time. We will also be highlighting the ways it can, brings more connection to each other and bridges our differences and how our people approach this with such care and compassion. For those of you joining Cultures United for the first time, we started this at the end of 2020 with the support of three amazing United Way board members, Martha Daniel, Tam Nguyen, and Ben Alvarado. And it was our goal to help promote conversations, collaboration, philanthropy, and unity in the community. Um, and again, it's been an amazing journey and I so appreciate our board members for stepping up for these important conversations. But I do wanna do a special shout out to California Bank and Trust and Ben Alvarado, because these conversations would not be possible without their sponsorship. So let's watch a sponsor message from Lisa Brooks, first vice president, community development finance division at California Bank and Trust. Good morning. My name is Lisa Brooks, first vice president in the community development finance division at California Bank and Trust. In this role, I ensure that CB&T is in compliance with the Community Reinvestment Act, which helps ensure financial institutions are meeting the credit needs of all the communities where they operate, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. Having spent over 20 years, nearly my entire career in CRA, I know firsthand the tough challenges facing low and moderate income communities, many of which are centered around access and availability to products and services that benefit people in the long term. These challenges include access to capital and technical assistance for micro and small minority business owners, financial education, affordable mortgages for people to begin the process of creating generational wealth through the acquisition of real estate. My work also entails supporting nonprofit organizations that create programs and critical resources that enable people and communities to thrive. CBNT partners with community development nonprofit organizations to make the public aware of programs we offer. An example of this is CBNT's Small Business Diversity Banking Program, which provides loans and access to capital for minorities, women, veterans, and LBGTQ small business owners. I am honored to work for an organization focused on providing opportunities for families and businesses throughout California to grow and prosper. Thank you for joining today's conversation. CPNT is a proud sponsor of the United Way. 
And we hope you are inspired by today's discussion, which aims to make our communities healthier and more vibrant. A huge shout out to Ben, to Lisa, and to everyone at California Bank and Trust. Thank you so much for your support. So today's conversation is going to be led by Orange County and IWA board member, Steve Cherm. Steve also serves as the leadership council chair for 211 Orange County. We are excited to hear the insights he will be discussing with our panelists. Steve is very well versed in this remarkable service because he's been with us since the beginning of since we brought 211 into Orange County United Way. And it's just such a, a trusted member of the community and certain a value advisor of mine. Steve, thank you so much for being here and leading this important conversation with us. Thank you, Sue. I am very eager to be here today. And first, I want to say to everybody who has joined us this morning, not easy to get online early and many places you could be, but the fact you're with us today means a tremendous amount to us and most importantly, your understanding of this, this critical service. As you mentioned, Sue, 211 Orange County is one of the most vital resources our county in our county for providing direct resources and referrals quickly to people in our county who need it. This particular topic is meaningful to me, as Sue mentioned in her introduction, because I've been watching in real time the positive stories that are coming out of 211 OC. You may not know that Orange County is home to nearly 3.2 million people, and a third of those individuals are either low income or living in poverty. Many of these individuals often need assistance, whether it's housing, financial aid, food, or health care services. For more than two decades, the 211 hotline service has been available here in Orange County. It has been the fastest and most direct link for many people to secure life-sustaining help. But this service can do more, much more. It's why the Orange County United Way last July acquired 211 with the expressed objective to improve and expand the reach of this service, which like Sue mentioned earlier, is the key hotline for social services in our county. Today, I'm joined by three amazing professionals who are committed to accelerating the impact of 211 OC for all in our community. Liz Andrade is joining me to first to share the insights and experiences that have shaped the journey and landed her at 211 OC as the executive director last fall. Then I will introduce two remarkable team members, Judith Ariano and Diana Delgado, who both work on the front lines of this service. They will share some stirring stories behind what they hear and see firsthand as they do this important work day after day. But first, let's get started. And I'd like to welcome to the program today, Liz Andrade. So Liz, good morning, great to see you and thanks for being here. Thanks Steve, good morning. Yeah, it's great. You know, before we dive into talking about 211 OC, a topic that's close certainly to your heart and mine as well, I'd love to hear a bit more about your background and how it adds to your experience in your role right now as executive director of this important service. Of course, I'm, I'm happy to. And it is truly a, a privilege to be here this morning and an honor to be serving in this capacity as the executive director for 211 Orange County and, and now under the United Way umbrella. So um, in, in quickly about me, uh, I'll give you my education. I'll give you some of my professional uh, experiences as well as some, some of the life experiences because as we have the platform today to talk about culture, I do think it's important to integrate that cultural experience to that background as well. And so I'll start with, uh, I am, a, Santa Ana kid, born and raised in Orange County uh, with my family. I'm one of six. And that's important because I early on in my life learned how to share in it. So I share well, uh, and that, that serves me well in this role as well as we share resources. Um, educationally, I have a bachelor's in sociology from Cal State Fullerton, go Titans. So just keeping it real local um, and started with uh, within the healthcare 
system. I was an admissions coordinator for a local emergency room very, very early in my career, almost 20 years ago now. Um, and so seeing the needs of people as it related to health and being able to facilitate care was, uh, what, uh, it was eye-opening at such an early age. And then moving into providing people with support with social services, I've served as a case manager. We always say that it was my favorite job. It allowed me to sit um, with a person and hear their story and build the trust that it requires for somebody to who is brave to share their story about some of the needs that they may be facing and, and how to overcome them. I always say we are um, a community filled with really strong people with tremendous grit to overcome challenges. Um, and then moved on into program management, uh, program design, implementation, evaluation, and then most recently served as the CEO for a nonprofit in Orange County that supports with uh, shelter and emergency housing, as well as permanent housing and food services. And so it just continued to open my eyes to how nonprofits work, um, the business side of nonprofits, the opportunity, and then the mission of why it's so important to support nonprofit work and how that inter the intersectionality between the multiple needs that people face when in crisis, how they all come together and how they're supported and identified. Um, and so educational and professional, and then just continuing with some of my, my own life experiences, you know, being uh, one of six, the oldest child, I like to say that um, at the early age of five, I started my case management career, coordinating care for my family members, uh, first generation Hispanic household with a variety of experiences growing up, uh, oftentimes, reflecting on that of uh, adversity and challenges and really proud of m my family and how they overcame those, those challenges. But as we talk today about 211, I wanna include that perspective th that I bring to this position as um, someone who has benefited from services offered through 211 from a very early age and not having any stigma or shame around that, but truly saying we are here for one another and uh, 211 helps to facilitate that. So thanks, Steve, for letting me share that. Well, thank you, Liz. And, and clearly you bring a background and a life experience that is so valuable to United Way, but certainly to 2110C. And um, the fact that you understand the landscape, the geography, you're from here, just adds to your ability to make an impact. So it's wonderful to have you and thank you for sharing that, um, I appreciate it. So let's start talking about 2110C. In short, how do you define what 2110C is? Because there are people perhaps watching this that aren't even certain what 211 is. So how do you define it is and, and the service that it provides? Absolutely. I define 211 OC as first and foremost, it's a number. It's easy way for people to connect, um, but it is truly the centralized hub for information and resources in Orange County. Um, and we, we can talk a bit more about what that means in a variety of levels of access to care, but in its most essence form, it is a way for people to connect to the resources that they need. Nice. Um, you've been with the program now just about five, six months. Um, can you give us a sense? I mean, we're getting hundreds of calls on a daily basis, thousands in a monthly uh, time frame. What it gives a snapshot of the type of calls that come in in terms of the needs that are out there. Absolutely. So, so they range. Um, in the last five months, I've had an opportunity to dive in deep into the data and understanding of who's calling and why they're calling and when they're calling. I mean, just the operational piece of ensuring that we are meeting the needs of the community members who are dialing in for support. But there has been a realization about the vast nature of the calls. I mentioned earlier the intersectionality of care that oftentimes is needed as a response to people reaching out. Um, but before I get into that more day-to-day -day type of caller, I wanna also highlight here that 211, and, and this isn't unique to 21 Orange County, but 211 is across the state and across the nation. We activate in times of emergency. 
And so that was one of the key learnings that I've had in the last five months. I need 211 from my previous experiences. And as I shared, I've used 211 in a variety of, of um, times and, and needs. But we also activated our, that support for all of the residents in the time of an emergency. And so in the last five months, we've activated twice during times of high wind. And so this means that when um, there are natural emergencies that occur or uh, inclement weather, that we are set and primed to respond to connect people to resources at that time as well. So just an important point for folks on today to, to know that that is a key service as well that we're offering. But going back to more of the day-to-day -day needs that we're seeing, um, the range is broad. Uh, we see calls for, for basic needs um, such as housing and food. This is connecting people to their local food pantry, um, ensuring that those hours of operation are active during the time that they are able to go and, and access that service. Um, health services, so calls related more so to inquiries about what medical clinic may take their insurance type or what type of free medical care they could access if they're not insured, how do they become insured. Uh, services around substance abuse programs, access to healthcare resources, mental health support and connection. Uh, we also see employment and income support, so individuals looking for job opportunities, career guidance, information on unemployment benefits. Uh, and then one that that is really key and we'll talk a little bit more about is the emergency shelter and housing calls that we receive. And these vary from people who are housed and trying to stay housed, so looking for support with perhaps rental assistance or utility assistance to help overcome that immediate danger of them losing their housing situation, as well as calls coming in for, for people looking for emergency shelter, people that are living in their car, they're on the streets, um, they're using the 211 number as their connection center to get them to a, a shelter or the next available resource for them. And then community programs and resources, and then legal aid is the other one that we, we see often, which is looking for referrals for legal assistance and advocacy services covering from issues from family law to immigration. And um, so that's really the nature of the type of calls that, that we're receiving through the 211 number. I think um, some terrific points there, Liz. And, and um, this next question to me is really vital. Um, um, we talk often about 2110C as a front door. It is an entryway um, to hundreds, if not several thousand different programs and services. Talk for a moment about um, how the information from 2110C is not only helping the Orange County United Way, but also dozens and dozens of other Orange County nonprofits and cities. Talk about the linkage and sort of the nerve center that 211 is to reach out to all of these amazing programs that exist and are helping people in this county. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, we do have currently over a thousand community-based organizations that are part of our directory of services with over 2,500 programs listed. And so we, we have three main, kind of a three-prong approach to the service delivery um, through 211. One is to the immediate need of the person calling, which we've discussed. Two is that support to the community-based organizations. So we see ourselves as kind of an inverted funnel. This was a great analogy that was shared with me by a longtime supporter of 211. Um, this inverted funnel, which 211 is that front door, all of the services are provided by those that they're being referred to. So it's critical that we identify the need of the person and refer them directly to that right resource at the right time. And for the community-based organizations, the CBOs that make up our tremendous vibrant network of providers, it's critical that they get that connection point um, to support their, mm -hmm. their um, efforts to serve the community and do so in a streamlined manner that promotes efficiency for them as well. Um, and then the third is the information to equip the CBOs in making decisions, how many referrals were they able to serve, how many were they not, who was connected and when and why. Um, that piece of it is really critical. But then that data, that centralized hub of information that we have access to as 211, that's critical for our, our decision makers, um, whether that be elected officials through our cities and our 
county and, and our state, but also to um, how we identify gaps and those opportunities that may be available. And so this community data that is collected and provided out will help to support identifying gaps. And the goal is to help um, create pathways to bridging those gaps and uh, supporting this vibrant Orange County where everyone has an opportunity to fulfill their full potential. I think that's a wonderful point because I think there's been a bit of a misconception that um, since United Way um, um, acquired 211 that somehow United Way is going to provide all of these services and programs. That's not the case at all. Uh, we are simply trying to improve that front door, improve that linkage with those thousand programs you talk about that exist here. So it's really pulling the nonprofit social service community together closer. So in a more immediate way that we can provide those services and relief for those people who are often calling us at very difficult moments in their life. So uh, very well shared. Thank you, Liz, for uh, touching on this. You know, we've talked about 211 in sort of a high level and overview. Let's Let's get a little more specific. Talk about some of the changes that have been made in the last six months uh, operationally to 211 to make it a faster, better, more effective service. Um, share some of that great news. Absolutely. Yes, it is great news indeed. There has been a focus and an intentionality around adding capacity. And so in the last six months or so, we've seen a 70% reduction in caller wait time which is tremendous. We, we know that the challenges that people are facing um, and the um, strength that it takes to call, to make that decision to call and ask for help or ask for support or ask for resources, that we, we take that seriously, that trust that the community lends to us. And so that reduction in the caller wait time from about 11 minutes to three minutes since being uh, since 211 was acquired by Orange County United Way demonstrates that commitment to the operational components that make up our our contact center and the goal of that is to, to get that caller wait time to two minutes or less and again knowing that the time of our callers is valuable and we appreciate their trust in calling us and so that we're we're eager to continue to report on that statistic terrific Terrific. Um, uh, in in terms of um, uh, uh, the needs, what are you and your call team, your your agents, seeing as the biggest request for resources? Yes, this has been consistent month over month, um, and it won't be a surprise to many who have joined us this morning. And the big the what makes up the largest bulk of the requests for service that are coming through are requests dealing with housing. So we see that over 52% on average are calls related to housing. So as I mentioned previously, people who are housed and trying to stay housed, people who are unhoused um, are, are calling and requesting support. And oftentimes it's not an isolated incident where they need housing and, and that's the only thing that they're needing. There's also on average 2.5 uh, resources or, or needs that are identified through, through that call. So it's housing as a largest and most significant component of that need. Um, and then immediate after that is support for how, for, um, for food and nutritional support. Nice. Um, in terms of what the numbers that you talked about mean, um, um, can you just put a, a bit of a face on, on the individual who is calling sort of the human side and, and, and their state of mind when they pick up the phone and dial 211? Absolutely. Yeah. So just to give some context around that as well, we, we serve about um, almost half a million requests for services a year. And so that's a huge number. Part of that is through calling through our contact center or connection center. The other portion is through text. So we want to make it as easy and accessible for people to get the resources that they need when they need it. And then the third piece of that is self-navigation through our website. So we're doing some augmentations there as well, which we're eager to share with the community as those roll out. But just on the on the human face of it, we see 70% of the people who are calling are, are women who are seeking support. And the place where they're typically at is they've either been referred to 211, they have 
been shared that number. Um, they remember it, uh, they maybe accessed it before, and they're calling with the expectation that there will be a service that matches their need. Um, and so that is our primary goal and focus has been to ensure that on the resource side, we keep strong connectivity with the community-based organizations. So when a program comes online or a program is no longer available, that we have that information and it's updated in our system so that again, we're making that right referral to that right time and keeping the trust of that community member who has made the decision to call and reach out for, for support. Terrific. Liz, I don't want you to go anywhere. You need to be still a part of this good conversation, but but thank you for really setting the table so wonderfully in terms of 211, its importance, where we are today, and really the individuals that are, are really relying on the existence and, and the high-speed operation of this, this important social service. I'd like to now to talk even more about the human stories behind the hotline. I'm going to bring up two care coordinators who are both truly on the front lines day after day of 2110C, answering calls and seeing firsthand the impact this service is having. I'd like to introduce Judith Ariano and Diana Delgado, who are going to join us now. And uh, Diana and Judith, great to see you this morning. And uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time and putting your headsets down and joining us to help educate us and and, and, and really familiar, familiar, make us more familiar, right? Uh, listen to me, mm -hmm. more familiar with um, uh, the program. And um, I'd like to have you both tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to this program and, and really became a care coordinator. And I'm gonna start with you, Judith. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm going to school for social work, so I definitely wanted to find a job where I would make a difference in um, helping people because that is what I want to do for a living. Um, luckily, I found 2 on one I was able to join the team. Um, and I'm really, really happy um, knowing that every day I come to work, I make a difference in someone's life. So, yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, Judith. How long have you been with 2 on one um, About a year now. Okay, terrific, terrific. Thank you for your service. Uh, Diana, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you, your background and, and how you came to 211. Good morning, everyone. So just a little sum summarization about myself. I've been working for 211 for almost about five years. I've had several opportunities to grow within the agency. Uh, I first started as an INR. I'll, I would take all the calls and speak to all the community members. I then transitioned over to CalFresh as well. And then now I'm a care coordinator for this agency. Uh, I've gone to school as well. I do have my bachelor in human services. I have worked with uh, the foster community as well. So I have a little bit of a knowledge as to what are some unmet needs in the community as well as mental health. I've also worked in that area as well. So I have a little bit of everything. Um, I'm able to still take those calls and work with the individuals who have those unmet needs. And it's a it's a really great feeling knowing that you're helping individuals on a daily basis. So I, I help out with a little bit of everything. Also with the Edison program, which Liz was mentioning earlier, we do help out when there is active alerts of high winds. So we do offer those emergency assistance as well. Well, I can certainly tell from both of you that um, there is heart and compassion to what you do. And, and I'm, I'm certain that many of us uh, today listening to this um, uh, just can't appreciate as deeply enough the work you do every single day. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, before we ask you about a couple of uh, stories, if you will, talk a bit about the mechanics of what happens when somebody calls, just walk us through a call in terms of how you address that person and, and what you do first, second, and third to try to stabilize the individual and begin to assist that person. So I'm going to ask you, Judith, if you'd lead us off and just, if I was to call you, what is that first couple of things you're going to do with me to, to get me into the right place? Of course. Um, so, of course, Ovi's a friendly greeting. Um, Ovi's introduced myself. This is Judith. Um, how may I help you? 
a lot of times the callers, like you mentioned, they are calling in distress. You know, they vent, they talk and talk, and that's great. The more they talk, the more I can help them. I listen um, with a lot of attention to detail, a lot of empathy, a lot of calmness in my voice to make sure they feel comfortable enough to tell me everything that's going on. The more information they give me, the more I can help them. Um, I start off asking their first and last name. I ask them for consent to create a profile in case they're eligible for the direct referrals. I enter their information into the system. What kind of insurance do you have? Are you a veteran? Um, asking their birthday helps me to know if they're a senior or not. So that way I could also give them the appropriate um, resources. Um, I ask them if they're getting CalFresh. If they're not, we do also offer to help people apply for CalFresh. Um, so that's also something that we like to know. Um, and then we um, proceed to ask them if um, like, they need any kind of assistance in regards to um, if their life depends on um, electricity for any medication or medical equipment, um, because we also provide um, th those kind of services at 211 as well. So um, it's just a number of different questions that we ask sure. and asking their zip code to narrow it down to what services are closest to them and which will service them. Terrific. Thank you. Diana, I'm sure that's a similar routine for you, but, but let me, let me ask you this based on what Judith just shared with us. Um, if somebody calls and they're agitated, they're anxious, um, they're distressed, how do you, how do you bring them to a place where you can have a conversation to understand what they need and begin to sort of guide them? Uh, what, what, you know, you've had to learn some 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 soft skills. Uh, talk a little bit yeah. about that. Of course. So sometimes callers do come in, um, do call us, and they're in distress. You kind of have to activate those active listening skills in order to better understand their situation and kind of read the tone of the conversation. Um, sometimes they could be agitated, screaming at you. Sometimes they could be crying on the other end, you kind of have to understand how you're going to orient the conversation. And at certain points, you do have to con take control of those conversations, only because sometimes they'll go on a tangent and they're just kind of venting and dropping all of their emotions on you. So you kind of have to orient the conversation to a place where it could become productive, because if not, um, the conversation will just be focused on their emotions, which we do provide empathy during the call, but we also tend to connect them to another agency that could provide them that empathy that they're looking for. Here, I would just like to orient them towards providing the services that they're needing at the moment. So whether they're needing emergency housing, um, they're needing food assistance, they're behind on their rent, we would like that to be our main focus. And if, let's say, they need still further assistance, we tend to follow up with those callers. So if they were um, emotionally overwhelmed at the moment and you feel that they would need like a follow-up call, that's where we can kind of follow up, say, okay, I, I'm sorry the conversation went on too long where um, I kind of dumped all my emotions with you. Let's follow up another day where you're a little bit more stable and then we can focus on what unmet needs you might have during the phone mm -hmm. call. Wonderful, wonderful. Those those are real life skills, and I have a deep respect for what both you and Judith do. We have time for one more question before we move to, to Q&A. Uh, we have some questions coming in from our audience today, which is wonderful. But let me ask both you, Diana, and Judith, if you might, without um, um, violating any confidentiality, we don't need to know first and last names necessarily, but is there a particular call, um, you know, in the last month or two that has really resonated with you in terms of uh, of an individual who needed help and 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 finding a solution that brings you a great deal of satisfaction in terms of why you do this, uh, Judith? Any particular call or situation that you might share with us? Yes. Um, about a month ago, I had a call from a mother. She was crying on the phone. She had a baby. Well, he wasn't a baby. He was about four years old. Um, they were living in the car. Her son was autistic and the mom was extremely overwhelmed. She did not know what to do. 
she was given this number 211 by social services to call for help. Um, and she was looking for housing. She needed shelter information. She needed housing information. Um, I was able to do an intake for her and connect her with an agency that could help her with housing assistance. Um, so the coordinated entry system, we were able to do that for her. I got her connected with a shelter. So she did have somewhere to sleep that night mm -hmm. with her son instead of staying in the car. I can't imagine, you know, that that feeling as a mother and your son having, you know, autism and in a little car. So, yeah, that really made a big impact on me, but it made me really happy that I was able to help her and get her connected. I did follow up with her. They did offer her rapid rehousing through the coordinated entry system. So she's now housed. She's no longer in the car with her son. So that made me really happy. <laughs> Wonderful success story. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Diana, a particular story that has um, stayed with you and really um, represents what you do every day. Yeah, of course. So this is a recent one. Uh, they had made an appointment with me to help them prepare for in case of an electrical shutoff event due to the high winds. During that phone call, uh, she kind of gave me a little bit more information on her background. She had just uh, gotten parental rights of her grandchild. Uh, she was a senior herself. So it is a, it was a little bit more difficult on her. Financially, she wasn't able to keep up to date with her bills. Um, I was able to create a report not only for my program, but also regarding her situation. I was able to connect her to a local agency, which was a local church. I did follow up with her and they did mention that they did not only help her apply for um, assistance for her electric bill, but they also offered to help her with her gas bill, which she had mentioned she was behind on, which was a surprise to her and which she was very thankful. And she did thank everyone here at 211 for providing the continu continuous support to the community. Along with that, I did also note down that she was having difficulty buying food. Um, she was struggling to pay food for not only herself, but also for her grandchild. I set her up with CalFresh and a month later she did follow up with me and also noted down that she did get approved for CalFresh. So that was a lot of help. I think it's wonderful that um, you, you in a very short time, the two of you are able to build such a relationship that, you know, several weeks down, down the road, they're letting you know their situation and, and, and how things have improved. Uh, um, um, that's really remarkable that you're able to make that connection in such a short time on an, an initial call that they will call you back. So Judith and Diana, thank you so much for pulling the curtain back a bit and sharing what you do on a daily basis. That's so important in our community. So thank you. And don't go anywhere. We're going to move to Q&A. But before we do that, Liz, I want to ask you one important question. What are the one, two, or three challenges that 211OC is facing today? And share a bit, because I'm sure we have some people online from cities or other nonprofits. How do they help 211? Or how do they get involved with the, with the service? Of course, yes. Um, so I'll say one of the largest challenges uh, for 211 has been what Diana and Judith just described is what happens when someone calls and the understanding of what service does 211 offer. And this, and I want to be really intentional about this, the way I answer this is that we are built to support people to connect to the resources that are available. And we are not, again, providing the resources um, in the community, but we are doing our very best to connect people. And we could not do this work without the work that the community-based organizations are providing. Um, and so the more that we have the opportunities to share and, and for it to be reinforced about what we're doing and how we're doing it and the reason why we're doing it, um, I like to think about us as infrastructure, where, where the roads, when people are trying to get from point A to point B, make that connection point, but we may not be their final destination. Um, really, the goal is for not to not have us be their final destination, to have them connect. And so I'd like to also mention that February is uh, recognized as 211 month and that awareness around what 211 is up and down the state and across the nation, what we do together to ensure that this model 
of community support is established within each of the communities um, that it resides within. And we are fortunate that we have 24 hour, seven day a week coverage. We do activate in times of emergency. That's not the case everywhere. And so we've had some additional recognition of this service by three cities and by the County of Orange during this time of awareness around 211, given that it's February and being recognized as 211 month. And so it just, uh, I would say that the challenge is continuing to reinforce who we are, what we do and why we do it. And um, again, not moving into any other swim lanes, but being really intentional and specific about it because in and of itself, this infrastructure is a critical service that's woven into the, the DNA of, of Orange County. I think you make a very interesting point. You mentioned um, nationally, 95% uh, of um, um, United States is covered by some 211 service. And we're certainly part of that larger community focused here on our county, Orange County. So thank you, Liz, for that. We're going to open this up to questions now. And, and the first question that has come in from our audience today is, I think the three of you have been very compelling today. You have connected with our audience listening. And uh, one of our, our, uh, our viewers wants to know what drives your passion to help others. And I'd like to ask that question to all three of you. And maybe, Diana, I'm going to start with you. Um, what drives your passion to do the work that you do? It has to do with my background. Um, unfortunately, I am first generation. We were uneducated about what was available um, to this to this country and to even the county. And now that I have the knowledge, I love relaying that information back to the community. A lot of these folks that are calling in are uneducated about what's available in the community. And I have the ability to provide that information and inform them and educate them at the same time because you never know when they would come across another person that's coming into the same situation they were once in. And so relaying that information about what 201 does allows us to expand our resources to individuals who have never been connected with us before. Terrific. Judith, where does your passion come from? Um, I think we all have needed help at one point of our lives, or we've known somebody who needs help. You know, if we ourselves haven't needed the help, somebody we know needs the help. And I love that 211 is able to provide some kind of help for those people. Um, so I feel like that's where my passion comes from. When I talk to my callers, I always think like, oh, this could be my cousin. This could be, you know, my friend. This could be mm -hmm. an aunt that's needing this help. Um, so that really drives my passion for my for this company. That's wonderful. Liz? Uh, echoing Diana and Judith, really, the, the reality of it could be anyone needing the help. And we are in this position to create this trusting relationship that nurtures the ability to make those connections and help people reach their full potential. And as I shared uh, earlier about my, my personal experience with, with services, oftentimes when someone goes through uh, adversity or challenging experience, they think, oh, you know, I, if I could do it, anyone can do it. And as I look back, I think I did it. I don't want anyone to have to navigate such a complex system. And so truly what drives my passion for 211 is making it simple for people in need to access the resources that are available. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I think the term hero is sometimes overused, but I look at the three of you um, uh, really as, as heroes in the respect that that you are you are providing such a critical service and and the fact that you come from such a place of understanding just just really elevates um, I think your ability to have that that kind of real impact. So um, thank you for what you do. You know the next question and I'm not sure maybe Liz you take this one, but um, um, kind of a, a mechanics question. Can a person or family who does not have legal documents seek help through 211? Yes, absolutely. Uh, immigration status is not a question that defers. Uh, we 
try to collect information on the type of eligibility that's required for each referral type so that, again, we're making the right referral at the right time for the right person, that that, that would not deter us from um, supporting and connecting. Great, great. And the last question uh, before we uh, wrap up this uh, terrific conversation today, thank, thank you to all three of you. Um, I'd love to know, um, uh, and if you could share, um, if you have one hope for Orange County's most vulnerable and how you see 211 in the future making a difference for those individuals. Do you have one kind of wish or hope for those individuals who need these services and how can 211 get better at, at, at meeting and delivering on that, uh, that wish? Um, Diana? I can go ahead and answer that one. Sure. Uh, one hope that I have for the most vulnerable in our community is that us as providers and also as community members, we can provide advocacy and empowerment with our community members. With 2.1 being a connection point, I hope to continue providing the empathy callers need along with helping them get connected to the critical, critical services they may, may need uh, during those tough moments in their lives. Terrific. Judith, how about you? I would have to agree with Diana. I think that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Liz, I'm going to give you the final word. Um, I hope you have um, um, for the most vulnerable and 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 the most important thing that 211 can do to to really serve that that segment of our population. With the goal of providing hope in each call that those who are making the call or, or sending the text message, that they are not discouraged by the process that exists today. Um, and then for 211 as, a, as an organization, as we move forward in a time of technology and innovation and overall community trust and what we see on the sh uh, short horizon and the long-term horizon here, is that we're able to use the information that we have available to plan to support those in the most vulnerable situations to reach their full potential. Well, as we close, I wanna thank all three of you, um, uh, Liz, Judith, and Diana, for the time that you've given us today and for the work that you do every day on behalf of United Way and certainly 2110C. I speak for myself, but I'm hoping the audience that has taken time and invested time to be here today uh, have learned a tremendous amount and um, feel even more, I think, uh, inspired and motivated to do more with 2110C. So thank you to all three of you. It's been a marvelous conversation. Uh, my honor to, uh, to be with you today. So thank you all very much. And at this point, I would love to turn this back to uh, Sue Parks, the CEO of Orange County United Way, for um, a, a few additional remarks. Sue? Oh, thank you, Steve, and a huge thank you to Liz, Judith, and Diana for, for, for being here and sharing your um, wisdom and information with us. I am even more inspired because of this conversation this morning to do whatever we can as Orange County United Way to support 211. Um, We've made some strides together in the last few months and we need to do more. So you are inspirational to me and that's my big takeaway. How do I, how can we as a community do more to support this very vital service? So Steve, as our 2 Leadership Council Chair, any thoughts um, that you want to add? Well, I, I think I have um, opined several times throughout the conversation today about um, um, not only my commitment, but uh, my passion. 4211OC, and, and it has only been elevated um, um, by the words of each of our three guests today. Um, I really believe that um, the work that's being done is changing lives. What we need to do in the coming months is make sure that there is a broader, deeper understanding and awareness of this service. And uh, I, for one, am committed to helping um, Liz and Diana and Judith and Yusu to make sure that we achieve that and that 211 is, is not just a number that's out there, but that is a number that's immediately recognized and truly becomes that front door to the kinds of services and programs that can help 
tens of thousands of people every day, every month, every year. Those people need a better quality of life and 211 is the front door to beginning to make that happen. So I'm very excited about today's conversation and again, honored to be a part of this. Well, well thank you, Steve. Again, a huge thank you for your, for your moderating uh, this panel. And many of us who know you, you moderate many things around the county, but that you're involved so intentionally on this work is really, really important to us. So thank you. And Liz and Judith and Diana, again, huge thank you to you for being part of our, now our Cultures United family and uh, and being part of this conversation. I know sometimes it's not easy to come and, and talk and you all were just so heartfelt and inspiring. So thank you. Um, so in talking about inspiration, I'm going to just build on that to talk about one of our big events at Orange County United Way. And hopefully many of you in the audience have been to our scorecard, our annual scorecard, where we report out. And we report out on you know, our work around homelessness and around prevention through financial security and our work with students on student success. And this year we're excited that we're going to have um, a discussion about 2 and one and take this conversation that we started today even further. So I'm encouraging any of you out there interested to learn more about this important work and all the work that Orange County United Way does is to come to our scorecard event. You can see it's on April 11, um, 11 to one at Singleton's Classics. It's going to be a really informative um, and engaging event, engaging event. So please, please join us for that. Um, the other thing I just wanna make sure that you all know out there is that Orange County United Way is celebrating 100 years. Yes, Orange County United Way is 100 years old in 2024. So we're on a journey, we're on our journey to 100. And there's many ways for you to get engaged throughout the year. And one way you can learn about those activities is to um, use that QR code, that squiggly thing at the bottom, take a photo, follow, or, um, follow that link and you can see what we've got planned. And again, we hope you'll join us. I mean, the vital work that this organization is, has done through 100 years is only a start. We are excited about the next 100 and 211 being a vibrant part of that future in helping our community. Um, so another way you can come and celebrate is a big event we're having on November 2nd. I think information is in that QR code, but we are actually gonna have a celebration event of our 100 years on November 2nd at the Arctic. It's that very cool uh, train station. Um, you've probably seen it lit up at night across from the Honda Center. We're going to have a very special uh, evening um, and encourage um, everybody to check that out and hopefully join us in our celebration. Um, Steve, any other thoughts uh, about today and Cultures United? Well, I think with Cultures United, our goal every single session uh, has been to learn from one another and really embrace our cultural differences and similarities, right? I encourage you really, all of you, if, if, if this program today has meant something to you, if you are leaving today's program really yearning for more, go back and watch some of the past Cultures United uh, conversations. Um, um, they are so meaningful and really reflect um, one of Orange County's biggest assets, and that's our diversity. Um, this is one of the most diverse communities in America, and for it, we're better, we're stronger, and the future is brighter. But we need to understand each other and both our strengths and those areas we need to improve, and, and Cultures United does that every program. So congratulations to you, Sue. Congratulations to everybody who listened today, and thanks, everybody, for, for caring enough to uh, support what we're doing. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, for your leadership and a huge shout out to Ben and Martha and Tam who helped get this whole series started. Until the next time, I wish everybody uh, to take care and be kind to one another because that's the OC way. So thank you so much for being part of this journey with us.